Today's um, topic on innovation is quite interesting because what we have here is a split um, between actual doers, uh, people who, who are actually innovating in, in Africa or with Africa, and strategists. So the strategists are Abdul Malik and um, Stefano, who's a consultant, and um, Ramesh, who's the founder of Isin, um, who's in services, bringing IP from India to, 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 to Nigeria, and, and, and Ismail, who's, who's the, the founder of, of World Meet. So um, let's kick the conversation off with how, we, how should we foster innovation in the sharing economy? I want to go very strategic initially and, and then we, we, we go to, to the doers. So I'll start out with you, Dr. Malik. Good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, before starting, I have two confessions to make. The first one is that uh, I'm humbled because I have this huge responsibility of speaking on behalf of these 400 million French-speaking weird Africans. Uh, and in this community, the sole solution that we have to every problem is to take a plane and go to Paris, drink hot cocoa in Saint-Germain-des-Prés, and ask our former teachers at Sciences Po Paris and uh, HEC, how can we solve the problem? But beyond that, there is an underrepresentation of what's happening in our community, and especially in West Africa. And to speak about innovation, I have the a first trend that I would like to share with you is that everybody is absolutely clueless in our region on how we can foster innovation. Because something major happened those last 20 years. In 1992, the global automotive industry in the United States was employing 1.2 million people and had a market capitalization of $80 billion. In early January 2017, one single tech company, Apple, had a market capitalization of $750 billion and was employing 80,000 people. So never in the history of mankind has technology destroyed so much white collar and blue collar jobs. So this is absolutely essential to understand why innovation is at the core of Africa's development and why it should be absolutely central in the conversation when we talk about Francophone Africa and how we can uh, foster it. So the key question, when you look at it on a strategic point of view, is why do we need the sharing economy and why do we need innovation? We need it because it has a multiplying factor that is absolutely essential. If I, if I have 20 pounds and I give you 10 pounds, the remaining that I have is only 10 pounds. But if I share with you information and if I share with you knowledge, if I share with you innovation, I'm not taking anything from me. We are creating added value and we are uh, taking it to the next level. So when you look at it at a strategic point of view, you need three prerequisites that are absolutely essential and that people should be looking at when you talk about Francophone Africa. The first one is talent flow. The problem in Africa is that you have one region that is well integrated going from Cairo to the Cape, and you have this Francophone region which is absolutely not integrated where you cannot have talent flow. You don't have a flow of capital. The second thing is consistency. When you look into innovation and access to capital in order to fund innovation, you need consistency in terms of legal framework, in terms of vision coming from the government, and consistency in terms of education. And the third one is very basic. It's security. If you want to innovate, you need security. And when you look at the most powerful and successful place that fosters innovation in the world, the Silicon Valley, it's no it's really weird to look at it that 80% of the people living in the Silicon Valley are migrants. But we, as Africans, we are migrants when we, when we have to go to the north, but we don't accept migrations inside uh, our region, which is something really weird. Because if you're in Morocco, you will have uh, the, the local authority would, would like to create the Moroccan Silicon Valley, but they wouldn't accept Senegalese people coming. So these are key issues. We have to question ourselves about 
what we are doing in the region to allow talent flow, to allow capital flow, and to allow consistency and security. And just to sum it up and give you some figures, in Morocco and in West Africa in general, every initiative that were led by governments in order to enhance innovation were big failures. The last uh, one that we had in Morocco, it was a $50 million fund in order to create nanotechnologies. And people from government had this weird idea that they want to create a center for nanotechnology because they found one Moroccan guy who has a PhD in nanotechnologies in Montreal, and they asked him, do you want to be the chairman of the next nanotechnology innovation fund that we want to do in Morocco? And the, the, the basic and the premise of this fund was to do cameras for cell phones and for smartphones. Of course, it didn't work because governments can only produce one thing when they do a fund. They can produce an administration and they can produce paperwork. This is what they're good at. But they're not good at creating opportunity, at making money, and at creating return. So this would be my final insight. If you don't see return, in innovation, you don't see uh, any uh, incentive in order to build it. And to finish, I will uh, leave you with one thought that is uh, really sad for us Africans. We are the region of the world that is the least productive of thought and of content production. If you look, look at the global map of content production, Africa is the least productive one in the world. And if you do uh, a research on database and knowledge database, such as, I don't want to do any advertising for companies, but LexisNexis or Factiva or Dow Jones, you can see that the word, the word Africa has been mentioned 70,000 times over the last year. But the first institutions that are cited when it comes to Africa are the World Bank, the IMF, the Security Council, and the World Health Organization. But this is very important, because that means that our image is not in our hands, that we are not content producers, and that we have to rely on third parties in order to tell our narrative. So the most important thing is that we should absolutely leapfrog content production. production. It needs to be publicly funded but it is also to be privately funded. And it's not just about innovation. The, every African produces one word per year. When it's compared to European, we're around 200 words. When it's compared to an American, it's around 250 words. If you're Japanese, you're around 300 words. So we need to win the battle of words. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Very, very insightful there, and um, very, very interesting point you, you raised with regards to the connotation of aid, you know, the, the impression of aid from, 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 from the outside. Now, I want to segue into technology, um, and this is going to be pointed towards um, Stefano. Um, how do you see Africa harnessing technology to, to drive innovation in, in the next decade and, and beyond? Actually, I'm going to go a bit sideways to your question. Uh, I think that technology is great, you know, it's a good thing. Um, but I think that we should also be a bit humble. Uh, I think that there are... Um, we are always thinking when we think about innovation, we think about technology. So yes, we have the M-Pesa of this world, we have uh, the equity bank of this world. We, there are some uh, technology success, successes in Africa. But we should also remember that, you know, for me, innovation is either you create something new or you make something that was not possible, possible. And for me, that doesn't necessarily come only with, with technology. So there is a lot of innovation on the continent that many people don't know about that has nothing to do with huge technology. There are many simple things that are happening every, everywhere in Africa that makes Every, every day's life of normal people, better. Uh, I can give you many examples of innovation. So we were talking about, uh, earlier about education. It is true that uh, I'm sure that of 
everybody sitting in this room, including myself, and uh, as Ramesh was saying, there is nothing, or maybe 10% of what we learn that we are using. So what do you do about it? There is now uh, a university, uh, which is called the uh, Africa Leadership University, that is thinking about it. And what did they do? They said, look, this is not working, and we should stop uh, thinking that we're going to teach everybody the way it's taught you know, in those uh, amazing schools that you have uh, in the Western world. Maybe let's do it differently, and let's use a model where actually we are developing a school together with the companies that are going to hire those people. And from day one, they're actually hired by those companies and working in those companies. And they take a complete different approach to education. So that's an innovation. Uh, have you heard about it? Not necessarily. Another innovation is uh, how do you make sure that uh, with the 50 naira that we have every day to spend, you can buy something. This is not easy because uh, if you think that you're going to use the products that are available around the world, uh, you will not buy anything. Companies in Nigeria are thinking that way and they think, okay, how can I make my products affordable? This is significant innovation and it hasn't necessarily uh, to do with, uh, with uh, technology. So I think, uh, you know, it's good to think about technology. It's good to think about creating the next uh, Apple or the next uh, Google. Uh, that may happen, but it may not happen, but we can still do a lot of other things. Very, very, very good point, Stefano, especially simplifying the, the lives of people. That's basic innovation, and, and that's what we really should be looking at in Africa. I'm going to segue to, to, to Ramesh in regards to... Um, skill set. We, we talked about harness and technology. How, how would you harness skills of people, human capital, um, in, in Africa today to, to, to drive the, the economic growth where, where we're looking to development, actually, economic development long term? So, you know, before I go to your uh, question and how do you develop the skills, let me pick up on the innovation piece. You know, when we talk about innovation, the first image everybody has got is, you know, as you mentioned, you know, you need to create the next Apple or next Tesla or something. You know, innovation is a, is a huge word when people say it. You know, it has to be cutting edge, it has to be nanotechnology, it has to be artificial intelligence, it has to be robotics and all the buzzwords which keep going around. To me, a simple thing can also be an innovation. You know, I mean, I'll give you an example. Which, which I was sharing with the panel before this. Um, healthcare is such an important issue. You know, there was a company in India which was doing and which did an innovation to produce sanitary napkins at five cents per piece. Now, you know, it's not nanotechnology, it's not robotics, but it's a very integral part of healthcare. Can that be copied here? You don't need to, you don't need to innovate, just copy it. There's a lot of low-hanging fruits which are available, which have been done in the world, which can be brought in, bring those, that, that's, that's where the skills come in. You see, you have to have the skill of saying, what's going around, what is the low-hanging fruit, we'll do our apple when the time comes. But right now, let's do the basic things correct. You know, we're talking about the fourth industrial revolution here. Nobody has fulfilled the first and the second industrial revolution. Half the people don't have electricity. I mean, how are you going to do innovation when half of Africa doesn't have electricity? You know, can we just take some solar panels and can we just take some ideas which have worked in other parts of the world and provide electrification? I mean, before we talk about the fourth, let's complete the first and the second industrial revolution. Look at some of the basic amenities which are missing in healthcare. Look at some of the basic amenities which are missing. And it can be done. I'll give you one example. Sorry, I'm digressing from your question a little bit, but I'll give you one example. Telecommunication is a big leveler. Everywhere else, you would say infrastructure, India is 20 years behind China, Africa is 20 years behind India and all that stuff. When it comes to telecommunication, you say the world is at par because there was a will, there was a requirement for everybody to build modern telephone infrastructure. And it was done. So today, you do the same 4G in Nigeria, what you do in United States and Europe. But you're not doing the same electricity. Why are you not giving it the priority? 
if you can copy the telecommunication networks, why can't you copy the electricity models? So when, when I talk about skills, I say bring the knowledge to Africa. And there is where, you know, uh, my fellow colleague said, I mean, we run a business in Tanzania and we do such so many skill transfers. In terms of nationalism, I'm just being blunt here, our work permits were cancelled overnight and people who were doing skill transfer were sent back home. We've been struggling to get a visa to DRC to open up a new business there for the last 15 days. If you're not going to give people visas to come in, if you're not going to give people work permits to come in, how would the knowledge transfer work? Okay. And this is to a company which has been doing business and has created 10,000 jobs. So you, you need to have an open mindset about saying, we would do it in Africa, but let's not wait for the next big thing to happen. Let's bring the know-how, let's bring the skills of what has been done elsewhere in the world. And copy that, get the basics right. My first focus would be, if I talk to anybody who can make a change, is would be get the damn electricity. Yeah, thank you. You know, and then we can talk about fourth industrial revolution. You know, everybody loves talking about nanotechnology. You know, everybody loves talking about artificial intelligence, big data, robotics, et cetera, et cetera. So I leave you with this thought that let's simplify innovation and bring innovation at a working level, at a grassroots level. Every small thing which you can innovate, innovate and make the better quality of life. Thank you. Great point about electricity and basic infrastructure, which brings me to my, my next question um, to, to Ismail, um, which is, is finance the cornerstone of innovation? You look at the... Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and um, you, you know, people are trying to feed themselves before they think about you know, other you know, um, more important things, you know, just other things in, in, in life. And um, do, you, do you think with, the, with innovations such as M-Pesa, um, you know, we're empowering ourselves financially to segue into other means of innovation um, in, in Africa going forward um, from, from a long-term economic um, development standpoint? Um, I think uh, Western media often focus on uh, innovations that are relevant in the West, and those are the ones that create the content uh, we often see online. But some of the most successful and impactful, uh, particularly financial service innovations, have taken place in Africa. Uh, I mean, I just came back from Kenya, where we were celebrating 10 years of mobile money. Uh, and, and we talk about 10 years of mobile money because M-Pesa uh, pioneered mobile money services, so M-Pesa is 10 years old. And today, 500 million people have mobile money accounts, people who have been unbanked. Uh, more than half of those are in Africa. And although we hear a lot about Africa, but there are a lot of very successful mobile money services in Africa that are really transforming the local economies. You know. Uh, you know, echo cash in Zimbabwe, where there is a, the economy is dollarized, uh, so there's a, uh, there are issues of uh, cash availability. I think without a uh, echo cash, the economy could have uh, collapsed. So really, uh, these services are making a huge difference, uh, shifting African economies from informal to formal, so we could then uh, provide IT services and others. I mean, look at Kenya. Kenya revised its GDP in 2014 upwards by 25 percent, largely because there were a lot of uh, uh, digital services that were not part of the uh, GDP measure previously. Interestingly, in the same year, uh, Italy revised its GDP upwards, but for Italy it was the EU allowed them to include the mafia economy, prostitution, drugs, so that helped it to boost the uh, it's GDP and come out of a recession. But in Africa, we're talking about genuine economic activities that have not been a part of GDP. So those are really the innovations we see in Africa. And take the case of Somaliland. I mean, it has got one of the most successful mobile money services in the world. It copied initially MPESA, but today, you know, to, uh, say 2009, 
Somaliland's GDP was 100% uh, cash. Today, Somaliland is closest to a cashless economy in the world. And that enables the economy to, uh, or entrepreneurs inspired by these services, to build services around mobile money. Thank you very much. That's very insightful. Okay, um, we're running out of time now. I'm going to take about three, four questions. Um, so, you. Um, okay, let's get to mi a microphone, please. Thank you to the panel. My name is Sanmit Ahuja. I run a clean tech focused uh, organization. I, I couldn't agree more with what you said about uh, copy what works. So there are two very interesting scenarios happening at the moment. Um, in energy, in water, and in waste. About $20 billion worth of R&D and innovation money has been pumped in the last two years. Um, and 90% of the applications of that innovation will be in the emerging markets. Okay. So Africa, Asia, LATAM are sitting on $20 billion worth of innovation ready to be deployed. The missing link is the entrepreneurs. Okay. So it's not just education, it's also a mindset shift. <laughs> that you cannot just lift and drop innovation. Africa has to adapt and create its own m like business models in energy, in water, in sanitation. We are bringing about 18 new technologies uh, into Africa. So my submission to the panel is corporate Africa has to accelerate the rate of innovation <coughs> diffusion into Africa. A uh, lot of the young entrepreneurs that we meet, they don't have the money. Uh, VCs will not back you until the model has been proven. So if you can deploy even half a percent of that in just building the pilot projects, you see the amount of VC money and the rate of innovation will accelerate. So, 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 so submission question? to you is, what will you do as corporate Africa to accelerate okay. innovation? So Derek, who's next? Well, who, who do you want to direct that the question to? Anybody, okay. Just two more questions and then uh, hi, my name's uh, Chris. Uh, I work at LBS. Uh, it's very interesting. We've been talking about innovation and what that brings to a place like in Africa where a little of that seems to be happening. Very little has been said about disruption. How do you find technology disrupting, or not just technology, innovation in general, getting disrupted and other businesses holding on to what they currently have? One more question. Over there, we, we've, sorry, we've not had Okay, I'll take two more. Um, just be behind there, um, laden glasses, and then um, th then then you are too. Um, hi there. Um, my name is Yemi, and um, I work in outsourcing, um, a Japanese um, subsidiary. Um, the question I have for the panel is: um, How how do you see um, the financing of innovation working um, in in the African context? Um, so, you know, taking ISON as an example, if you needed to add an extra 10,000 employees, how would it work um, in, in order to, you know, to expand? Um, hi, my name is Stephanie. Um, I, I've just, I've got kind of two and one questions. I've been listening to the different panels today, different um, talks throughout the day, and um, one of the thing, one of the questions that I've got is based on something that I haven't quite heard anyone really talk about today, which is a focus on the people. Because okay, I, I appreciate obviously this is a business summit, and we're trying to encourage people to be entrepreneurs. But the reality is, when you go back to Africa with our Western education, people aren't taking into consideration the fact, like when you go back home, the people that you're going to need to build the business. Uh, lacking a certain type of education. Yes, there might be some mindset issues, but how do you, I guess, essentially get the buy-in of the people that you're trying to help? Because a bit like you said, there's the basic needs that they have. And as good and flashy as innovation sounds, there's a lot of processes that can be changed, especially in workplaces. When you look at medium enterprises, for example, they don't have basic HR functions, so half of their people don't really understand the value of the work they do. There's high turnover, and there's all of that. So it, the corporations are one thing, but the businesses are fueling the economy now. How do you 
help entrepreneurs, I guess, if we're trying to raise them, keep that in mind and create the processes and the systems of their business to incorporate that. And my second question, um, I would direct to Ramesh. You meant we were saying um, deal with the basics, the low-hanging fruit, you know, bring in electricity. But how do we go against the very um, fabric of, I guess, corruption and coming in? And it's not as easy. To, we might have ideas we want to use solar, wind, water, whatever, but there's still policies and certain t the way the infrastructure is or the lack of it that doesn't make that so easy to do it on a large enough scale to make that much of a difference. Okay. I don't know if that... Many thanks. Okay, let's start out with the, two, the $20 billion opportunity with regards to the, the lack of entrepreneurs um, in emerging markets that um, are not filling in the gap and um, the research you know, going on in energy, water. Um, who wants to, to take um, the first question? I, I understood the question a little bit differently. You, t you talked about how do you finance uh, those people and what is the finance mechanism? Did I understand that also? Uh, yeah. So I think actually uh, this is for me something else that needs to happen, which is when you talk about innovation, innovation in funding is also critical. And I think that we completely lack that in uh, everywhere in the continent. If you think about the way it works in the Western world, you know, you have the seed, the VC, the private equity, etc. They all have different tickets level and it's very organized. And then they all try to come with the same model in Africa. And of course, it doesn't work. And then, of course, what happens, first year returns are not there, so then you say, oh, my God, it's not working. Let's get out. There is nothing to do here. And then you don't have the money. So it takes then the entrepreneur in that specific area to actually jumpstart the system. And we start seeing that happening. I mean, of course, it's not to the scale you would like to have it right now. But when you look at the, the, the private equity market now, there is a rethink about that market because they are all came to the realization that they are not making their earnings. And so now they, st they start to look at smaller firms who use a completely different approach and they are making their earnings. So those smaller firms had a different uh, compensation um, package for their staff. They took much more risk. They were funding very uh, small tickets. And in that way, they can help those entrepreneurs. But it will take a long time to scale it up. But again, it's innovation in that specific field. Thank you, Stefano. Um, we're running out of time, so the next few answers will be a minute at the max. Um, so the next one really is, is, is down to disruption. Um, what, what areas in, in, in Africa? So we, we have five minutes. Um, yeah, so let's talk about disruption. You know, I'll try to maximize my 60 seconds. And, uh, Go for it. <laughs> Let's just address very briefly the elephant in the, in the room and get into the business of uh, mass slaughtering of uh, sacred cows. All of you guys raised questions about governance and corruption. If you want to have innovation, we need to tackle those issues. And of course, I agree with you when you talk about incremental changes and getting uh, first and second and third industrial revolution, but we need across the board policy measures that can tackle the issues at stake. And one of them is very simple when it comes to innovation. It's cashless economy. You have to take stuff from the informal sector and put it inside the formal sector. If you prevent people from making payments above $100 and they cannot do it with cash, you are creating a game changer in African economy because then they can pay for electricity then they, can, they, can, they get inside the banking system, they get inside technology, they get inside the knowledge economy, and you enhance governance. Because nobody and no civil servant can pile up millions of dollars of cash because they're worthless. He cannot do anything with it. Thank you. Um, Ismail, what, um, what areas, what sectors, or what, what, what industries are ripe for disruption in, in Africa at the minute? I think the I think what the mobile money services have enabled a lot of African economies is the means to do things which were quite difficult. I think earlier we were talking about uh, you know ICT, Kenyan freelancers, IT you know coders, uh, copy editors, 
uh, competing with Indians and Filipinos now because M-Pesa allowed them, enabled them to get uh, paid quickly uh, using the likes of uh, well, Upwork and, and, and so on. So, so that has enabled, it has, uh, telcos are now doing interoperability. So MTN is connecting to uh, Safaricom, Tigo is connecting to MTN. So that is already beginning uh, trade within Africa, again, creating uh, services. And, and African entrepreneurs are building around these services that are uh, allowing uh, a lot of, you know, for, for Africa to uh, make, you know, benefit from the uh, advancement in te technology. So, so I think we were, we're seeing a lot of those, uh, or at least the financial services are enabling for those technologies uh, uh, to, to, to benefit the, uh, the masses. Okay. Um, final question is to Ramesh. It's a double barrel question, unfortunately. It's um, how you'd add the 10,000, you know, jobs if you were to expand um, ISIN and um, entrepreneur education. Um, how, how would you... Um, pretty much, um, you know, educate, you know, um, entrepreneurs um, to be, well, is, is entrepreneurship, innovation and entrepreneurship actually, can it be taught and how, you know, how would you, you know, teach it if you were to go? So, you know, we are doing, again, you know, the project manager in me always would give you an answer which is ground uh, zero answer. So we are doing our bit in it. We launched something called an ISIN Innovation and Investments. So there is a fund called I3. And I3 fund is uh, uh, in between stage of seed and angel. And what we do with these companies, we've done about 16 investments so far. What we do is not only do the mentorship, but we provide them our infrastructure of 25 countries. So to foster innovation, what you need is if you're a Kenyan person, you don't know how to go and expand in Nigeria. You know, you're too small. So what we have been trying to create in our own little way is exposing our platform of 25 countries to the new innovators, adding some money to, to it, providing them the leadership which has been developed over the continent. So those are the kind of small efforts which are happening. I'll also tell you, you know, I was, I've been seeing a lot of activity in this, not only ISIN, but you know, I was with uh, Dave McLeod, who is the founder of 500 Startups, and he's starting a fund, 500 Startups in Africa. He was in Africa last month. He's been talking about it. So there, are, there, there is stuff happening. But again, you know, we've got to 10,000 people. We've got to 10,000 people as a bulwark. You know, but for us to grow from 10,000 to 100,000 people, you need the ecosystem to come together. You need the governments to help. You need the academics to help. You need laws which are transparent. You need to be able to repatriate money because the investors are very, very, you know, you go and invest money in Nigeria, and the repatriation laws don't allow the money to go back or the money would go back at 400 naira to a dollar. You know, people are nervous. So unless, if you want to attract investment, the policy framework should say that if you bring in a dollar, I'll let you take the dollar back. It cannot be one-way traffic. So I think a lot of initiative uh, has to be taken at a government level to ensure the people invest for a return. And if they're not sure about a return, as I told you, you know, we are growing 40% year on year, but we are degrowing by 10%, and we can't take money out. How do you bring investment in this climate? So, thank you very much, Ramesh. Um, good points with regards to stability and creating incubators in in Africa. Could you give the panel a round of applause, please? It's, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much, everybody.